Brilliant. So I'll make a start. So um, you're all very welcome to this evening's webinar or information session. Um, as you can see, the title is the Intro to Autism, a Parent's Guide. And my name is Ashlyn Karevi, and I am the coordinator of Galway Autism Partnership. And we were very, very lucky to be approached by Galway City and County Library Services to develop and deliver this very much this beginner's guide to autism um, and a little bit of instruction around autism. So if you are in the audience, I suppose, and you consider yourself a beginner, you're definitely in the right place. If autism is new to you, you're currently waiting on an assessment or somebody close to you has just been assessed or diagnosed, this is definitely the place for you. If you're not that new to autism, if it's something that you've been familiar with for quite a long time, I still hope that there might be something that um, you'll learn from the, the five weeks that we have or from at least part of it. Um, and I hope that the information that I include tonight is very much um, accessible for everyone, that it's very understandable. So I've kept it very brief, I've kept it very simple and straightforward, and I've kept loads of time for questions at the end. So if at the end, if you do have a question, if you feel that we haven't covered it today or you don't think we're going to cover it in the next four weeks, either unmute yourself and ask or you can pop it in the, the comments section and I'll be looking at them then. So I am just going to make a start there now. Um, again, if I seem a little bit distracted, it's because I am I'm admitting people as they come into the waiting room. But I'm, I'm just going to start off. So again, thank you for giving up your Tuesday evening to join me. And I hope that this will be worth your time. So a little bit of an overview of what, about what the five weeks are actually going to cover. So today is as beginner as we can get, it's the intro to autism, very, very much just a general approach, learning a few terms about what we do here at Galway Autism Partnership and just learning about the nuts and bolts of autism. It's a huge subject, so we're not going to cover it all in 45 minutes, but I hope that you'll be going away with a little bit more of an understanding at the end of this. Week two is all about supporting your child or the person that you support during behaviours that challenge. And that session has all actually been developed with Sinead Taylor, who is a child and adolescent therapist that has a lot of personal and professional experience working with autistic children and teenagers. So we will be looking at strategies to support a child that's in distress or showing behaviours that challenge. So a lot of the parents that I would talk to on a daily basis particularly when their child is upset, anxious or in distress, they may see an increase in things like meltdowns, aggression, self-injurious behaviour. And we're going to look at some of the techniques that you can do at home to support your child or your loved one during that time and what you can do to keep them safe and yourself safe as well. On week three, I have worked in consultation with Sabrina Brown, who's a speech and language therapist based in Balnasloe. And we're gonna be looking at all about communication, which is obviously very important when we're talking about autism. There's a lot to learn when it comes to communication and autism. And I hope that you'll find that very helpful. So again, we're gonna be looking at practical, easy to use strategies and supports that you can introduce at home without having to be a fully trained speech and language therapist that will hopefully promote communication, promote language and social interaction in your kids or your loved ones. And week four, I've worked with Simone Mitten, who is an occupational therapist, and we'll be covering all on sensory perception and regulation. And again, this ties in very much with a child's state of regulation or dysregulation. So activities that you can do at home to help them kind of stay on an even keel, in a good mood um, and well regulated at all times. And at the very end, in week five, we're going to bring all that learning together and we're going to talk about your family's future. And in that topic, we'll also be looking at things like school, primary, secondary, third level. We'll be looking at things like, you know, social activities, your child and how they connect with the community. We'll look at an array of different things that taking all that learning and kind of looking at how your child fits into the community that they grow in and how your family fits in as well. And just before we make a proper start, I'm just going to make a note for every, anyone who's new to GAP or anyone who's new to any of these sessions that we do. You might have noticed that I use identity first language. So I'm saying autistic people, autistic children, a family of an autistic person. 
as opposed to saying a person with autism or a child with autism. And the reason I mention this is it can sometimes be a little bit jarring to people because I think as a society, or if we've been to school or college, we're kind of used to learning about person first language. So that would be a person with autism, a person with Down syndrome. And the reason that we actually use the identity first language is that has been um, spotlighted by adult autistic members of GAP as their preferred use of language. They actually find that they identify stronger with that identity first language. And a lot of them say, you know, autism is a part of my identity. I am autistic. It's not something that I can pick up and put down like an accessory. And a lot of adults are quite proud to call themselves autistic. Now, you know, I'm of the opinion there's no right way, there's no wrong way. Everyone should be able to refer to autism in their own way. It's totally personal to them. We just, as an organisation, try to honour the request of our adult autistic members. Um, and again, another disclaimer I will make is I am not an autistic person myself. I'm a non-autistic um, person delivering this presentation. I have family members who are autistic and I've worked with the autistic community for the last, like over a decade, but I am not an autistic person. So everything that I talk about in the session today comes from the learning of autistic people. And if you ever want to hear an expert advice or opinion, talk to an autistic person, an adult or a child, because they will give you the true autistic experience, not me, but I'll hopefully be a little bit of a go-between between between the learning of our autistic friends and our, our non-autistic friends too. So I'm going to briefly just touch on what Galway Autism Partnership does. So like I said, I'm the coordinator of GAP. We're a community-based charity supporting autistic people and their families in Galway City and County. And some of you may have heard of us already, or we might be completely new to a lot of you. But I just wanted to mention our charity so you know that the support is available in the community should you need it. So the charity was established in 2011 by parents of autistic children to bridge the gap in service provision. Our vision is for a society that is accepting and understanding of autistic people and their families, ensuring their right to equal opportunities and participation. And our mission is to improve the quality of life experiences for autistic people by providing quality peer support, information and advice, social activities such as clubs, camps and family days, and then training and education. So what we're doing at the moment would be considered training and education. Um, but a lot of the work that GAP does involves those social activities. So after school, weekend clubs, summer camps, holiday camps and things like that. Um, and we have a really lovely community in GAP of children, teenagers, adults, family members, grannies, grandas, professionals. Um, and it's just a really welcoming place. Um, so I won't go into what we have been doing throughout the COVID-19. I'd be keeping you for a long time if I did. But just to know, I will include the contact info, my own phone number and my email at the end of this presentation and it's very easily accessible online so if there's anything you would like to know more about if you have any questions just reach out that's literally what we're here for so if there is something that you would like to know more about just give me a phone call tomorrow and we'll have a chat about it so you're very welcome like I said to this presentation and to the world of having an autistic family member or you know having a family member assessed for autism and it's very much a journey that's not planned. It's not something that when a child is born that you're thinking, oh, this child may or may not be autistic or neurodiverse. But more and more, we're seeing that children and young people are receiving an autism diagnosis. So in Ireland, currently in secondary schools, one in 64 children have a diagnosis of autism. And that's a lot when you think about it. Even in a small secondary school, there'd be a good proportion of children who have that diagnosis. And that doesn't even cover the children who might not meet the criteria for a diagnosis or they've never been sent for an assessment. And they certainly exist too. And they may have particular needs even without receiving an assessment or a diagnosis. Autism is also four and a half times more likely to be diagnosed in boys than in girls. And I say more likely to be diagnosed instead of, you know, more likely, because the truth is 
we don't know if that statistic is really accurate in, represent in representing how much girls and women are autistic but not diagnosed. We do know from research and from the evidence that's out there and from people's experiences that girls and women present very differently. And it's not at all uncommon for a teenage girl or a young woman to get a diagnosis later in life because they don't necessarily present the same way as boys and men do. And the criteria that people are looking at when they are assessing someone for autism, they have all been developed and researched in boys and men. So it's kind of, um, I suppose, girls and women are on a bit of the back foot there when it comes to being assessed for autism. And also it's important to remember that autism is not an intellectual disability. So a lot of people think that it is, but it's not. It's actually a developmental condition. Um, and that's not to say that autistic people do ca can not have intellectual disability. So, the prevalence is thought to be around 40 to 50 percent of autistic people have an intellectual disability. And we also know that autism is reported across all racial, ethnic and socioeconomic groups. It's not more commonly diagnosed in one group than it is in others. It seems to affect people of all creeds, all backgrounds, all socioeconomic status. And there are some characteristics that um, signify autism or that professionals will be looking at or examining when it's time to assess for autism. And first and foremost, we know that autism as a condition is highly variable. That's why we call it a spectrum of abilities. So you could have two children who are diagnosed at the exact same time by the exact same professional and they may present completely differently. They may have completely different abilities and yet they still have the same diagnosis. And it takes a little bit of time to get your head around it, but I think that's one of the most beautiful, intriguing things about autism is that there are shared commonalities, but the uniqueness and the differences are really, really apparent. So autism, like I said, is a developmental condition. And that just means that it affects a person in pretty much, you know, all arenas of their life. So their motor skills, cognitive functioning, social and language. So their cognition and information processing can be different. And you will always hear to me refer to as a person's ability as different rather than impaired or poor, because the best research that we have out there indicates to us that there's absolutely nothing wrong with how an autistic person functions and thinks and, you know, how their brain works. It's just different to what a non-autistic person is used to. So when we look at things like cognition, we're thinking of things like attention, memory, logic and reasoning, um, things like that, ability to organize your thoughts. So an autistic person's kind of ability to think and process information can be very, very different. Social interaction obviously can be very different for an autistic person. And often this is an area of most concern for parents and carers when their child is diagnosed, is worrying about you know, their friends and their relationships. So again, their social interna interaction is not impaired, it is just different. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about that over the coming presentation and over the coming weeks as well. And then also, we know that um, an autistic child or adults can communicate differently. And this relates to both their verbal and their nonverbal communication, which we are going to explore more when we talk about communication. A very, very um, prevalent uh, characteristic when it comes to autism is that they are very passionate and have very, very strong interests and behaviours. And again, this isn't something that I would consider at all to be an impairment. I actually think this is a real strength. You know, a lot of people can be totally fascinated by something and they put so much time and energy and in turn it gives them so much enjoyment, so much happiness and they can go on to work and study in that field and it brings them a lifetime's worth of happiness. So, you know, sometimes you will see passions or hobbies or interests referred to as specific interests or rigid or restricted interest, which again, I personally think is just putting a negative outlook on what is actually a pretty positive thing, 
Um, but you will see it, you know, if you have a young child who maybe is showing traits of autism, they might prefer one game over everything else. They might like to line up their cars in a certain way and they could do that for three hours nonstop. And it just, you know, they get so much enjoyment out of it and it completely um, you know, takes all their attention and all their focus and they get a huge amount of joy from that. And then, of course, a big part of being autistic is that unique sensory experience. And again, that comes with its own unique challenges and its own unique strengths. There are a lot of sensory experiences that can be very difficult for an autistic person, and yet they can get a huge amount of enjoyment out of certain sensory experiences. So I know that's kind of a whistle stop tour through some of these characteristics, but we are going to go into a lot of these more in depth and there will also be the opportunity to ask questions if any of these terms don't make sense or they're confusing. So you'll probably have heard the autism spectrum referenced, and I know I spoke about it in the last slide, but what actually is the autism spectrum? You know, what does it mean? And um, basically the autism spectrum indicates that autistic people, though they share a common diagnosis, they have a spectrum of needs and abilities. So to put it very, very plainly, autistic people will be very, very good at certain things and they will struggle with other things that maybe other people don't find that challenging. And when we think of a spectrum, sometimes we think of it as a line, you know, and you land here on this point, when really it's more like a 3D graph with this spiky profile. So just looking at this example here, a child might have quite a lot of challenges when it comes to language but they may have very, very good motor skills. Or a child might be, you know, academically very, very intelligent, so their executive functioning could be quite high, but they might have a diagnosis of dyspraxia, so they're quite clumsy, they find it hard to do fine and gross motor skills, some tasks are very difficult for them. And that's why we see a unique profile in all the autistic people that we work with. There are always challenges, but there are always unique talents and areas that that person is very, very strong in. And that's really important as well, because a lot of the time, the medical profession or society in general tends to talk about autism in terms of impairments and negatives. But really, there are a lot of talented, clever, intelligent, loving autistic people out there and they deserve that recognition and again just looking at that profile there so just think of the child that can remember hundreds of facts about the solar system or world war ii but they can't tie their shoe shoes and they can't take turns in a game when they're playing with other people or on the reverse of that you might have a child that is you know fantastic at reading absolutely or sorry, not reading, but maybe, you know, a child who is very, very skilled when it comes to physical tasks. So like cycling, they might have excellent balance. They can nearly like climb the walls without hurting themselves. But yet maybe their language is a bit delayed or they might have challenges in other areas of their life. So all children, all adults have this kind of profile of what they're really good at and what they struggle with. And I think that's the same for people, whether they're autistic or non-autistic. Sometimes it's a bit more obvious for autistic people, but I think if we were to do a little bit of self-reflection, we would all see that we definitely have areas for improvement and things that we are very good at naturally. So just a little bit of a recap. So what is autism and what's it not? So autism is a neurological diversity. We tend to stay away from words like disorder, disability, um, because purely because they make people feel bad and they can really affect the self-esteem of our autistic friends and families. It's not a disorder. It's not a mental health disorder. That's a very important point. You know, um, sometimes professions might say well, this child's in need of mental health intervention. They're autistic. And that's not necessarily the case. Autistic people can have brilliant mental health. They can have really, really fantastic um, resilience and self-esteem, just like anyone else, you know. Autism is a different way of thinking and processing information. Autism is also a lifelong state of being. It's something that people are born with. There's no cure for autism. 
And a lot of autistic adults are quite offended by the notion of being cured. They're kind of saying, you know, would you want to be cured of your Irishness or your personality? Um, absolutely not. So it's not curable. It is a lifelong state of being. Autism is quite common. The prevalence rates vary from study to study, but like I said, we think about one in 64 secondary school students have a diagnosis in Ireland. And it can seem at the time when your child is being assessed or they've been diagnosed, sometimes you feel that you're the only person that you know who is going through this. But the truth is every day in Galway city and county, people are being referred to assessment lists. Um, we are seeing more and more and more children being referred for autism assessments. Um, so even though it can feel very, very isolating, you are not alone in that, in that experience. So it's not rare, it's not abnormal, it's not weird, it's just a different way of being. And autism is very complex and varied, just like everybody else. You know, we are all unique, we are all completely rare and who we are. And I think that is the same approach we need to take for autism. We're treating each person like an individual. We are taking the learning that we might know from other instances, but we can't apply it universally for everyone. And autism is not inexplicable. Just engage with an autistic adult or child and they will be well able in a lot of cases to explain what they're going through. So this slide is not to give anyone a shock or a fright, but this ex explains a little bit about why sometimes autistic people can experience further difficulties on top of their autism diagnosis. Because like I said, autism, you know, can occur in somebody and that might be the only diagnosis they happen, but it can also occur alongside any number of other diagnoses, just like everybody else. So on this list, you'll see there is the same, I, I suppose, like any non-autistic person has a, um, a chance of developing some of these conditions. That's the same case for an autistic person. So we sometimes see issues with sleep disorders, ep epilepsy, gastrointestinal disorders, and then mental health and autism, you know, that can be quite a complex relationship. So autistic people, like I said, are not, um, autism is not a mental health disorder but they can experience any of those mental health disorders alongside their autism. Then there are sometimes also developmental disorders that can occur alongside autism, which is some things like dyspraxia, which can be issues with fine and gross motor skills, dyscalculia, which is difficulty with no numeracy, numbers, dysgraphia is issues with writing, uh, intellectual disability, like I said, 40 to 50% of autistic people will also have a co-diagnosis um, of an intellectual disability. And sometimes autistic people have language delay. And again, like I said, this slide is not intended to scare or worry anyone. This is really just a reminder that autistic people, like anyone else, can experience an array of physical and mental illnesses. And when a person is encountering a challenge, it's worth remembering, it's not necessarily their autism. It could be any number of things. If you have an autistic child and they're very, very cranky, it's not necessarily their autism. They may have a, tooth, a toothache or an ear infection or something like that. So, you know, it's just a reminder that Autism is complex, but it also can occur alongside any number of other conditions like anyone else. Just to be aware that um, before we intervene and we look at the autism, we make sure that a child is physically and mentally healthy as well. And who is autistic? We've been talking about the world word a lot there. And I'm sure if you're attending this talk this evening, you probably have some personal or professional connection to autism. But it's good to get kind of a picture in, um, social, in, in society and in the media of who is autistic. And I always think this slide surprises quite a few people because there is really a, just an, an amazing variety in the lifestyles, the careers that autistic people can go on to have. So in the top left of my screen, we have this man here is called Adam Harris. And he is the CEO of an Irish autism charity called As I Am. 
Adam Harris actually founded that charity when he was 17, the same year that he did his Leaving Cert. And I always like to remind our non-autistic friends and like how many of you set up a charity when you were 17 to do your Leaving Cert? So none of my friends have. So I think that's quite a remarkable accomplishment. But it also gives hope to people because when Adam was younger, he attended a school for children with special needs. He actually attended a school for children with special needs up until the age of 12. And he received significant support of a special need assistant and psychologist. And also his mother, his mother did a huge amount of work with him. And he went on to accomplish so, so much with those supports. And it just gives you an idea of what can happen when potential is nourished and when people are treated as competent. So in the middle, the top middle here, we have Daryl Hannah, who's a famous actress, so things like Kill Bill, Splash, she would be famous for those roles. And Daryl Hannah is an example of an autistic woman who was diagnosed a lot later in life. So she would identify herself that her autism meant that she spent her life acting in a certain role, the role of a typically developing woman. And that, that acting is commonly referred to as masking. So you're masking your true self to fit in with society's norm. So she says herself, she made a career out of masking. And that's why acting came so naturally to her because she had been doing it since she was very, very young. But now she is a proud autistic woman and advocate. And then to our top right here, we have Dan Harmon, who is a director and creator. Um, if any of you have teenage children or you might be aware of Rick and Morty, which is very, very popular amongst teenagers or so I'm told. But Dan Harm Harmon created Rick and Morty, he created Community. And it was actually when he was researching a character who had autistic traits for the television show Community that he noticed, actually, I have a lot of these traits too. And he went on to be diagnosed as autistic. So to our bottom right, we have the very, very well-known Greta Thunberg, who's an amazing young woman who is, a, now, I believe she's now 17, but she has spent a large amount of her life advocating against climate change. And Greta herself credits her autism as to being the reason why she is so passionate, why she can't sit by and watch the world burn, because her autistic brain simply will not allow it to happen. And then in the middle, we have Carly Fleischman. So if you don't know who Carly Fleischman is, I really recommend that you go onto YouTube after this um, webinar and look her up. She's a fantastic young woman who presents a talk show with celebrities and politicians and musicians, and she does it all non-verbally. She uses um, an iPad to communicate, to ask questions. And I think Carly is a wonderful example of not not forgetting about people because they don't communicate verbally. We can't just, you know, pretend like she's not there. She's having her say. She is out in the community. She is talking to people. She's raising awareness of autism and she does it all non-verbally through the use of a communication device. And last but not least, on the bottom right, we have Stephen Wiltshire. And Stephen is a UK based artist who, when he was younger, Stephen was also nonverbal. He later went on to develop verbal ability when he was a bit older, I think around six or eight. But Stephen is an artist who creates these amazing ink drawings of cityscapes. Um, he'll go up in a helicopter for about 20 minutes and he'll draw these gigantic pictures of cities, famous cities, London and New York. And again, you know, he used his a bit his passion, which was art and drawing to develop his communication. And it's important to remember when you're looking at this picture, this um, examples of these fantastic, uh, these fantastic advocates and representations of autism. Most autistic people are just normal, you know, <laughs> they'll go on to leave completely normal lives. They won't be famous. They certainly won't be savants or have amazing out of this world skills or knowledge. And that's OK, too. You know, the reason I show this screen, this presentation is to kind of combat some of the negative stereotypes that people have about autism. We've often just been fed the one stereotype of 
Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman or a child, a small boy rocking in a corner. And there is so much more to autistic people than, than those representations. Um, again, just a reminder, anyone can be autistic and autistic people can be anything. I think one of the hardest things to deal with when you are pursuing an assessment or your child has been diagnosed is that concern and that worry about the future. What's going to come next? What is going to happen for my child? You want them to achieve the absolute best. And I just want to put your mind at ease and say that is totally possible. Every autistic person can have a fantastic quality of life. And again, just an example, this person here is an advocate and a teacher. Um, he's an autistic advocate and a teacher, and he does a lot of speaking regarding autism. And if you just notice the books on his table, I think you'll get an idea about what his special interest or favorite hobby might be. And then down here in this picture with the kids, this is a picture taken from one of the community events that Galway Autism Partnership has hosted in the past few years. And what I love about this picture is that any one of these children could be autistic or none of them could be autistic or there could be a mix. Like you just don't know when you look at this picture and it just, you know, it reminds me of the fantastic community that we have. And I hope that it will maybe remind you that your child or your young person is still that same person. They have a diagnosis, but they are very much a child, a young person, a young adult, whatever they are. So getting back into the kind of the technical stuff, what does a diagnosis actually mean for my child? What, what does it mean? So for every person, this answer will be different. But in general, we know that autism means that a person communicates differently with the people around them, with the world around them, and how they communicate their needs, their wants, their ideas, and how they understand how everyone else communicates. We know that sometimes autistic people perceive sensory experiences differently, so they can experience the world around them, just the sensation, so sight, sound, taste, touch, and um, texture, and I'm definitely missing one there, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, that's the one. They can experience all of those five senses differently and that will in turn affect how they interact with the world. Again, down here, I mentioned that, um, you know, an autistic person will have very specific interests, hobbies, passions, um, things that really, really drive them and motivate them. And I picked this picture because I think it's fairly common for young children to kind of line up toys. Um, it might be an image that you're maybe familiar with from your own child or maybe from the past a few years ago. So you might give a child a brand new toy with all these functions and buttons and all they want to do is line it up on a windowsill or the corner of a table or something like that. So they, they um, interact and play with things differently and they enjoy things differently than another child might. And then, of course, a lot of autistic people will experience distress, anxiety, and that can result in behaviours that challenge. And that's a very, very um, important area of concern for parents and carers. Nobody wants to see their child in distress or upset. And sometimes the typical strategies that might work with a non-autistic child won't necessarily work with an autistic child. They might need a totally different approach, but it can be really heartbreaking to see them when they're upset. And I know that causes a lot of worry and upset for, for parents and carers. So, like I said, we are actually going to go into a lot of this in, in more depth in the coming weeks. So I'm going to not linger too long on any of these slides, but I'm just going to give you a sneak peek about what we're going to cover in the coming four weeks. So, of course, communication is something that autistic people do differently. So both the receptive language, which is what they hear and understand, so what you say to them, and their expressive language, so what they say or express. So whether it's verbal or something they're writing or something they're pointing to, that's all expressive language. A person who has difficulty with receptive language might find it difficult to understand or they may need additional time to process information. So when your child, have you ever been in the room with your child 
and you call their name and you ask them to do something. And you may as well have been in a different room. You may as well have not said the thing at all because it's like the child has not even heard you. So that doesn't mean that there's an issue with the child's hearing. It means that they may have difficulty with their receptive language. So understanding what you've said, or they may have difficulty with their processing. So actually taking that information in and processing it, what does it mean? And then expressive language, people who have difficulty here might struggle with communicating effectively or getting their meaning across. So a child with language delay, a child who repeats the same words over and over again, even a child with speech impediments, they can have challenges to their expressive language. And a very common challenge um, or I suppose issue for autistic children who have difficulties with expressive language is echolalia. And that is repeating bits of language, either from dialogue that they've heard other people saying, or television or a song or a book or something like that. So let's just say, for example, um, say you say to your child, how is crash today? And they just go crash today. And they just say that last bit that you just said. So while it is language, it's not necessarily functional. They're not using it to communicate with you. And, you know, if a child goes around repeating their favorite um, TV show or their favorite song over and over and over again, that can be an example of echolalia. It's not something to worry about at all. It's just an example of how a child can communicate differently. And sometimes an autistic person's language might contain unusual phrases, repetition or out of context statements. So they may say things that are totally unrelated to the conversation. It might be a line from their favorite um, TV program and you're kind of going, well, where did that come out of? Um, that could be fairly common as well. Autistic people might have difficulty understanding figurative language. So things like metaphors, simile, and then irony as well. They might not understand sarcasm or, you know, they might not notice the difference in a tone of voice when it's modulated. So you might be really, really angry about something and they might not even notice or you might be super stressed out and it's coming across in your voice, but they might not be aware of that just by hearing you. Um, they, a lot of autistic people prefer to talk about their favorite hobby and interests and don't really like to engage in things like small talk, like how are you, How's the, what's the weather like, things like that, you know, and that can sometimes seem that they are being rude or uncaring, but this is definitely not the case. It's just autistic language to talk about your favorite thing. And you will notice if you see a group of autistic children get together or adults or teenagers, and they are brought together by a common interest. So let's say, for example, a favorite TV show or music or something like that, they will have no problems in communicating with one another because they're all talking about their favorite interest. However, if you send them into a room full of strangers and ask them to, you know, just go and make friends, that can be very, very challenging. So moving away from the topic of communication and on to behaviors that challenge, which are actually very, very interconnected. You know, there's one does not exist without the other. Um, so when a person does not have the functional or appropriate methods of communication, they will use forms that are considered socially inappropriate by others. And this is why we see behaviors that challenge. So tantrums, crying, meltdowns, screaming, hurting themselves and others, destruction, grabbing objects, throwing, shouting, bad language. You know, if you're very lucky, you're not familiar with any of those, but it does happen. Sometimes we have children, young people and adults that lose the ability to communicate and they feel the need to express themselves through these other forms. So like, I'm sure if you have young children or have had young children, you'll be very familiar with tantrums, crying and meltdowns. And these behaviors are very, very disruptive for the people around that person, but they're also highly effective, particularly someone throwing something at your head. And I, I always use this example. I used to work in, in Scotland 
in a center for adults, autistic adults, res residential setting. And there was a lady there and I'm gonna use the name Marie. So Marie had her own flat and every day somebody would come in to support Marie and you know, get her up in the morning, have breakfast and go about the day. And Marie, like myself, really enjoyed a sleep in. So people would come in at half seven and say, time to get up Marie. And she would say, she would communicate to them either verbally or through gesture. She wanted to stay in bed longer. But the support workers who were a great bunch were kind of going, oh no, but we have so much to do today. We have to have breakfast. She has to take a shower. We have to go to the bank. We have to do the shopping. I don't know if we have enough time for this. I have to get her up now. You know, they had their own prerogative too. And Marie would tell them again, she didn't want to get up. And they tried, they, they, were, they were to and fro. And then Marie would pick up a mug from beside her bed and throw it at their head. And they would come down to me and say, I need to record an instant. Uh, Marie threw another mug at my head. And I would say, oh, that's awful. Okay, what happened before that? And they would say, you know, well, I tried to get her up and I tried to get her up. And, I tried. And, so, and then we would notice that Marie was communicating, but her communication was not being heard. And if it was being heard, it was not being validated. So her control is being taken away from her. Something that she really, really wants to do, she couldn't. And that's when she would then throw a mug because it's much more effective at getting an irritating support worker out of my bedroom than asking them politely. So behaviours that we find challenging are a commune form of communication and they're always trying to tell us something. It's not always immediately clear what it is they're trying to tell us, but they are trying to tell us something. If we support an individual to feel safe and to use appropriate communication, we will reduce the likelihood and the risk of these behaviours. And, you know, that's easier said than done. It takes time. It takes consistency. But that is the key to reducing behaviours that challenge is giving a person the means of communication so that they don't feel the need to throw that mug or to have a tantrum or cry. Um, and again, like I said, we are going to cover this more next week in much greater depth. Um, these are just some examples. Again, like I said earlier, I am not an autistic person, but I had consulted with autistic people to develop this presentation. And these are some examples of what it feels like to have a meltdown. Um, and a meltdown is different than a tantrum. It's complete overwhelm of the senses and the ability to function and to communicate. So just to pick a few, you know, it's like a volcano, it builds and builds and it builds so fast into a big explosion and it's fire that destroys until everything is gone. Or, you know, down this here, this one, you know, it's like a train that won't stop. So it's out of control. Once it's over, I feel emotionally numb. After a good night's sleep, I'm ready to conquer the next day. And again, that's an important, for, um, important uh, quote because physical recovery is often necessary after a meltdown. You know, it's not something a person controls. It's not something that they can do on purpose. It's not something that they can stop in the moment. It's nearly something that has to run its course because it's so hard to get control back over. And a meltdown is not something that just toddlers experience. Um, children, teenagers, and even adults can have meltdowns when their needs are not being met and when the environment is particularly particularly unfriendly to them. Like I said, we're going to go into this in a lot more depth in next week's session. So I'd like to briefly introduce you to the wonderful world of stimming before we finish up and start asking questions. So you may have heard of stimming before. I hope I'm not preaching to the converted already. But if you haven't, stimming refers to self-stimulatory behaviour. So these are behaviours that children, adults and teenagers do to self-regulate. Um, first and foremost, everybody stims. It's not an autistic trait. We're fond of saying that autistic people are just better at stimming. Their stims are bigger and more obvious, but you'll probably notice that I'm taught, uh, when I communicate, I gesticulate with my hands. That's a form of stim. It helps me to regulate. Some people click their pens, some people twirl their hair, some people bite their nails, some people tap their feet but we all have behaviours that we engage in to self-regulate. They might be really, really small and not very obvious, 
but I can guarantee if you think about it, you have a stim. And stimming is so important to autistic people. If there's one lesson you take from this um, presentation, it is that stimming is great. Stimming is good. I love this little badge down here saying flappy hands or happy hands. There was a time when autistic people were prevented from stimming, that the kind of the, um, the, the, the fashionable thing to do was to discourage stimming because non-autistic people thought that if someone was stimming, they couldn't be paying attention, they couldn't be listening. But the research shows that this is actually the opposite, that stimming is really important to helping people process things, to understand things and to regulate their mood. So think about it this way. If you have a child that's in school, if they are upset because they have all this energy inside them and they can't fidget and they can't move their hands and they have to sit perfectly still, they're not going to be able to learn. They're not going to be able to understand and process what their teacher is telling them because they are putting all their energy in and attention into suppressing that feeling. Whereas if they were allowed to flap their hands or move their fingers, they would be allowed, able to process what's going on around them. So this is just an example of all the different types of stimming. There's loads and loads and loads. Tactile is like, you know, touching different textures, rubbing hands, fidgeting, moving your fingers. Visual stimming can be, if any of the children that you know, um, maybe line up their toys and then kind of like move around and see it in different lights, that's a type of visual stim. Or if they squint at lights and things like that, that can be a visual stim. Or even moving their hands across their eyes like that. Auditory stimming is very, very common and very cute a lot of the times. There's verbal stimming, so it's things like singing, echolalia that I mentioned earlier is a type of verbal stimming, making noises, clicking, repeating phrases, olfactory stimming. If you have a child that smells your hair or your jumper or anything like that, that's an olfactory stim. And then things like, these are the big ones, like rocking, jumping, pacing, swinging, flapping hands, toe walking, loads of big movement. Those do a lot to regulate autistic people. Um, and they're the ones that are probably the most obvious and probably get them into the most trouble, unfortunately. So that will bring us to the end of session one. I hope I haven't kept you too long. I am now going to, yeah, I suppose just a reminder before we go into questions, just to give you a little bit of a sneak peek about what's coming up next week. Like I said, we'll be looking at support for behaviours that challenge, and I will be delivering the presentation that I have developed in partnership with Sinead Taylor, who is a child and adolescent therapist that works with a lot of autistic children and teenagers. We will be looking more into that idea that a behaviour that challenge is, is communication, understanding the neuropsychology of your child. So trying to understand how an autistic brain might process information and how it can then result in a different response to stress or distress. We'll be looking at fight, flight, freeze and fawn, which are some of the survival methods that not just children, but also adults will engage in if they feel like they're in threat or in danger. And most importantly, we'll be looking at strategies to use that will help your child and reduce behaviours that challenge.